Hello and welcome to The Champions. I am Mona Lisa Dube and in this program we have conversations with individuals that have made great strides in their different fears of influence. We're talking about innovators, educators, leaders that have influenced the young people to be a better version of themselves. Now we'll take the opportunity to tap into some of their wisdom and knowledge, their experiences and lessons along the way so that it becomes easier for the next generation of champions. Our guest today Today is Dr. Munyara Zigwatizo, who's fortunately given me uh, the right to call him Munyara Zi for this interview. Yes. Uh, he is the Chief Executive Officer at Astro Technology, and he's a co-founder of the Astro Mobile that we all know, and he's going to give us more information about all of this in this conversation. Thank you so much for making time to chat with us today. Thank you very much. All right, so walk us through your journey, where it all started. Everyone has a life story. What is your life story? You know, my life story is, is pretty long. Uh, I will try to really, you know, be as short as I can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always, you know, laugh with my friends when they call me that, you know, you're a very old, old young man. <laughs> um, you know, mainly because of, you know, the things that I've gone through mm -hmm. in terms of my journey as an entrepreneur. But my life started in Bari. So I'm a very much, you know, Bari boy. Mm -hmm. I was born deep, deep in Bari National. You know, those people that know Mbari, they would understand what I'm talking about. Um, I was very unfortunate that at a very young age, uh, I lost my mother and I was raised by a single parent. And when I was 10, my mother passed away. So it kind of changed my whole life, um, you know, me and my siblings. Right. And, and I'm always telling people that's, that's when I pretty much learned entrepreneurship. Because at that age, uh, me and my siblings, we, we had to learn life skills at in 10. terms of at 10 in terms of how to, to look after ourselves. So pretty much what it meant was after school, you'd have to like put a small little market yeah. outside our house and you pretty much start selling tomatoes and stuff like that. So when other kids are out there playing football, playing all those different sports. They're making money. They're making money, I'm making money. So at a very young age, I understood, I understood entrepreneurship because right. you had to be accurate on the change. You had to be accurate on the calculations. You had to actually know that if I put five tomatoes here, it means I'm making a loss. So I need to actually make three tomatoes. Right. So for me, that's where the, the entrepreneurship journey started. But you know what, as, as then, as I grew up, you know, finished my my, my, my high school. And I always tell people, I, I didn't manage to go to a fancy school. I went to a school in Chipinge called Shibue. I don't know if many people even know I'm where that school. I'm from Chipinge, by the way. Oh, oh, all right. So I think you might probably know Shibue area if you're from Chipinge. Um, because my, 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 my Sekuru had to then take me right. and, and live with me in Chipinge because we're just like siblings. And I said, okay, you can come here and learn here. Uh, obviously, it's not the best of experience, but at least you've got an adult that is looking after you. So, right. um, you know, my, my entire life was, was that life of fighting for survival. Hmm. That even if you're at school, you have, to, you have to get good grades so that you get to get your fees paid through bursaries right. and stuff like that. So when you were in high school, did you also, were you also involved in any entrepreneurship activities there? You know, I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So even, even at school, you know, when, you know, I had, you know, pocket money, you then pretty much go and buy sweets and stuff like that. So and I, resell. I've, and resell. So I've always been a person that had been, you know, reselling some stuff. Because once, whatever money that you'd get, you probably not get anything else, mm -hmm. you know, for the entire term. Because, you know, my brothers, they were so young and they couldn't afford to do much. And they were actually trying the best they could. So, so pretty much it, it taught me to be very responsible. Right. You, know, uh, you know, if I have got a dollar, how can I make it $2? How can I make it $3? So, so that was the journey. So I then finished school, right. um, you know, and, and unfortunately I couldn't go to the university um, in as much as I want to believe I was, you know, one of those bright students. Um, but because of that, I had to look for a job because I had also had, you know, siblings and, and, and family for. to look out for. So you have to make a choice. Should I go to university abroad? And um, what then happens you to, know, the family. to the family? So you had to make those tough decisions. So I, I was forced to look for a job at a very, very young age. Um, at what age it, is this? I think it, I was 17. I think I turned 18 when I was already working. So 
I remember, you know, when I was employed and they were saying, is it legal or illegal to employ I was going someone? to ask the next <laughs> question to say, yeah. were you allowed to be employed at that age? Yeah, so, you know, but I said, you know what, I'm going to turn 18 this year. But I think they were fascinated about, you know, the level of ambition right. uh, that I had and obviously the story. And, um, you know, they, they wanted to help. So I was fortunate to work in a bank uh, during that time and, um, you know, as a filing clerk. So it was not a, an important job. It was, you know, that job where you would file checks and people used to use checks during that time. So each and every day you'd be able to see, oh, okay, this guy's got a million dollars, this guy, and you don't Did have anything. Yeah. You? Did that inspire you at all, working in that environment and seeing this amount of money every day? No, yes, it, it really inspired me because, you know, you know the people when you work in a bank. You say, oh, okay, this guy's got so much money, but he looks so simple. Mm. And um, there's nothing really special that he does. So obviously, you know, being exposed to that, it kind of motivates you to be able to tell you that you can also become and you can also do this uh, because these are human beings like myself. So, you know, working in a bank, it played a huge role in actually stretching my faith, if I can say, in terms of that I can achieve anything that right. I want and I can achieve anything that I believe that I want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Before we actually get to how the idea of uh, actually coming up with mobile phones came about, I know that you've gone in detail about how you grew up. I would like you to emphasize on what influence that had on your mentality and your approach to life, all these circumstances around you. Yeah. So. These circumstances, for me, I think the, the most important thing or uh, positive effect that they did to me um, that I still appreciate today was, you know what, your background doesn't determine where you are in life or where you want to go. Right. Irrespective of how you were born, where you grew up, you can still define your destiny. And uh, also, you know, growing up in very harsh you know, environments like what I did, very poor background, um, it, it, it then taught me that money doesn't mean anything. How, what do you mean by, by saying that? Um, you know, what I mean is it, it helped me to be a person who's not driven by money, but it helped me to be a person who's driven in terms of addressing, um, you know, challenges that people are facing. So from there, my main thrust in life was driven from a philanthropic uh, perspective to say, you know what, I want to make money so that I can make a difference in wow. other children's lives. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't go through what you had to go through. They don't go through what I go through. So I believe that I had to do as much as I can. And, um, you know, to that, we've kind of assisted, I've kind of assisted quite a lot of, you know, disadvantaged kids, maybe close to a thousand in terms of paying school fees and right. doing whatever I do. So for me, it then became a motivation to say, you know, I can make a difference. If I had someone that would have helped me, I would have probably been better than what I am today. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of helped me to see things from a different perspective. That people are, are poor not because they choose to be poor. People are not in those situations because they choose to be. In some cases, you're just born into a situation. Right. Um, so so it, it kind of shaped me in terms of, you know, uh, being focused on much bigger, you know, uh, problems than being focused on me. Something interesting that you highlighted to say that you didn't let your background define where you were going, yeah. but to what impact did it have to who you are today? Um, I think the greater part of who I am, it, it was because of that, mm -hmm. because um, I was not scared to take challenges. Even when I started the first you know, mobile brand in Africa, and being a black person and right. being 22 years old, it was, being, it was driven by that. Because I knew that I can be who I want to be. Mm -hmm. I knew where I came from. And I said, if I survived that environment, if I survived that background, I can become whoever I want to be. Mm -hmm. So it really propelled me to be fearless. So let's talk about that. Yeah. You said that you were the first black man to come up with the uh, mobile initiative in Africa, the GTI, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. So we are in an era where there is Samsung, Nokia, iPhone, and here you are, 22 year old, why would you want to start a phone when there are all these big brands? Because I felt that whatever the big brands were making mm -hmm. was not solving the ultimate problem. So you find out that in Africa during that time, you know, less than 5% of the people had cell phones. Right. So, and the focus for the big brands was never really about Africa. It was about their own countries. So the costs of those devices didn't speak 
to an average African who is, you know, uh, living in the rural areas. So it, it prompted me to say, you know what, we can still come up with a mobile devices brand that is affordable, that everyone in Africa could afford. And they could also be part of the, the, the digital revolution um, and communication revolution which was happening during that time. So, so for me, you know, there was no one doing it and someone had to do it. Right. And I didn't see anyone doing it. And I told myself, why not do it? Mm -hmm. You see, so, so yeah. Okay, we will speak more about uh, the brand and where it is now. We take a quick break, then we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We have Dr. Munyana Ziguatizo, the co-founder of Astro Mobile and the chief executive officer at Astro Technology. Now, before the break, you were just telling us about what prompted you to actually invent a phone, uh, the G-Tide. So tell us about the G-Tide. Um, that was, I think, one of the loudest <laughs> phones I've ever I know, come right? across. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. I was in the bank. Working in the bank, obviously, that was not enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, cell phones came during that time. And obviously, there was a problem, which was there. You didn't have people that were able to fix the phones because it was a new technology. Mm -hmm. And as a person who is self-driven, you know, I gave myself a challenge to actually, you know, you know get one of these phones, break it up, and see how... So you, you actually know, took a, a phone and you broke it down to see what it actually looks like? To see what it actually looks like. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I was working with my managers and they were having issues during that time with phones that had network problems. So pretty right. much you buy the phone and all of a sudden it started to, to lose network. So I took an initiative to say, okay, let me look at it. Right. And uh, from there, that's, you know, how I saw where the problems were. Mm -hmm. So because and of what the, were these problems? Um, because of there was high temperatures and the soldering which was done to the antenna would actually melt over time. So, you know, as it melted over time, it actually then started to lose um, a signal because there was no solid contact. Sorry, so, at this point, yeah. you do not have a technology background, you don't have an engineering background. That is, this is just interest from your end. Yeah, so this is just passion. Mm -hmm. So I've always been very passionate about tech. And, and electronics, even at a very young age. You know, uh, I remember even, you know, my brothers telling me that when you were very young, you were seriously beaten by mom because she had bought this new radio. And you actually, you know, teared off the speaker, trying to look for the person inside. Wow. You know, those, those are the kind of things. I think it has always been a passion for mm -hmm. me to do that. But, um, you know, after that journey, um, um, I actually started the business by actually, I always tell people by actually, you know, going to Zambia. I actually said my first sales for phones were actually in Zambia. Mm -hmm. Because what then I then saw, one of my friend then told me that, you know what, you can make more money, you know, when you sell phones in oh, Zambia. So at this point, you've already started making the phones? At this point, I'm, I'm repairing phones. Okay. At this point, I'm, I'm now buying broken phones oh. and I'm now fixing them. Mm -hmm. and, and at this point, I'm charging people for fixing their network problems. Right. Yeah, over the weekends, mm -hmm. after work. Okay. Yeah. So, and then let's talk about the idea of actually creating a phone. How did that happen? Where did you start from? Um, where I started from was, you know, during that journey of fixing these phones. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I on a weekend, on a Friday, I would then jump into a into a into a bus uh, after work. Then you know go to Zambia. Then we would arrive on a Saturday. Then I would sell those phones that I would have bought and, that I would have bought that were broken that I would then fix and right. sell in Zambia. Then obviously come back on a Sunday, arrive Monday morning at, at 5 a.m., then go home, bath, come back to work. So it became a journey for me. It became like a routine for about six, seven months. I would buy broken phones, fix them, go and sell them in Zambia. Because during that time, there was Forex in Zambia. Mm -hmm. There was US dollars. So you come here, you exchange them. It was a lot of money. Right. But even after doing that, it was not enough for me because a second-hand phone that time would still cost $200, $150. Mm -hmm. Many and millions of people Cannot still couldn't afford. afford. That. mm. That's when I then, you know, researched and, and I then found out that these phones were made in China. Mm. Then I then started to make a contact in China. Uh, you know, I then found a company in China, um, you know, put all my savings, took a loan again from the bank. I flew, I went to China. You wow. know, um, you know, very young. I didn't know anything, know anyone in China. It took me three days. I was getting lost until I went to the factory that I wanted to go after meeting some Nigerian who then could speak Chinese, who then helped me to figure out you my way around. just met him there? Yes, I just met him there. I was just roaming around and you saw another black person and say, you know, can I help you? Wow. You know, do you need assistance? So the first encounter, unfortunately, it was not successful because they wanted a bigger investment. I didn't have money. All I wanted to do was to convince them to partner me in producing affordable phones for Africa. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work. So when the, the conversation went out as, you know, as expected, I come back to Zim, lost all the money, used it on the plane and to travel. Mm -hmm. Then I went back on the routine to Zambia actually... Back. So before I, back. I let you proceed with this, yeah. what I'm picking up from you is sometimes just passion is not enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's not enough. You have to to continuously, you know, push for what you want and you have to find other ways to make sure that you actually achieve that dream. Mm -hmm. So after I came back, you know, a couple of months later, actually a year later, the, those Chinese guys, they then contacted me and said, oh. no, we have actually seen that there's a growth that is happening in Africa and you happen to be the only person that we know mm -hmm. because you once came here. Are you still interested in launching an African brand? Wow. We can partner with you. And I said, yes, of course. There's a year later. Yeah, yeah. And I said, but no, I, I don't have money to come to China. So mm -hmm. pretty much they then paid everything for me. From there, that's when I went to China. Um, and that's where the noise of the phone comes in. Because I then said, you know what, I want us to customize the, ex the user experience. And the only value addition that you get in a phone is radio. Oh. And not everyone will afford to buy this phone. So what it means, you're most likely to have one phone per house, or in other cases, one phone in four houses. Which also works as a radio. Which also works well, as that a radio. Was the idea. So I wanted, I made the speaker to be very big, so that when someone is playing radio, everyone can hear it. But unfortunately, the same speaker that you use for radio is the same speaker that is used for when the phone is ringing. Yeah. So we had to trade noise versus music. Uh -huh. So that's why I find the signature for g tide was they all had very loud they were. speakers. Yeah. yeah. So, so so after yeah mm -hmm. okay. So what what was the progression now when you realize that okay you have a target market and for this it was affordable phones but again like you're saying the noise was a bit too much you know so what was the progression then to the mobile phones that you have now? So the progression was obviously from G Tide, um, you know uh, then come up with the brand uh, G Tide uh, you know Guatizo Tide. Oh, uh, that's what the G stands yeah, for. Yeah, that's what the G stands for. So we, we then started that. Then um, the Chinese said, obviously, don't have money. We produce the phones. We keep them here. Mm -hmm. We'll be sending in the batches of 200, 300. Mm -hmm. Once you sell, you send back, we send you more. Mm -hmm. So it then became that. And I think we started marketing the brand. Uh, GTAD became very popular. Mm -hmm. And I know at some point, even in Zimbabwe, we had more market share, more than Nokia, which was something that was just like amazing. Right. You know, where people like were so surprised. And many people didn't actually know that G Tide was, 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 was a Zimbabwean brand. They thought right. it was a Chinese brand or, you know, an international brand. But it's a brand that we managed to build. But, you know, to move, it, it was a success. Um, you know, at some point we sold more than 5 million units of these phones because we had started expanding as well in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very exciting, you know, to have started a brand that was very, 
you know, successful like that. Mm -hmm. But the journey was not as smooth. What do you think, I know yeah. you, you, you've spoken about marketing just now, but what do you think actually contributed to the growth of, of your brand, especially in a market where they have like all this competition, international brands that we have spoken about? Um, I think it spoke to, to, to what people were looking for. Mm -hmm. And in that time, people were looking for access. And what was standing between them and access was affordability. Right. So we addressed the affordability issue where we made it possible for millions to be able to afford. So it made the marketing much easy because you were, you were talking about something that people could actually afford. You're actually making their dreams of actually owning a phone come true. I think if you remember during that time, a cell phone was like a symbol of, of, of status, well, yeah, of sorts. wealth. <laughs> you know, people would put them at the back there and you, know, you still remember the Chimbetu, you know, video where he was like, you know, showing off his phone. That's how phones were, were, were regarded during that time. But we, we changed that mm -hmm. by making sure that the phones were affordable. Mm -hmm. So everyone had a G-Tide um, and, and uh, we, it was exciting about that. But still, you know, then coming to your question in terms of, you know, how we ended up where we are, mm -hmm. you'd find out that, um, you know, after building such kind of a brand, you know, um, you know, we had partners, we had the Chinese partners, we also got local partners that we had here in Zimbabwe. And um, I was very young, very excited building such kind of a brand. But these important things that obviously I did not put in place during that time. So in as much as such I was, as? I didn't have a shareholders agreement, for example. Hmm. As basic as that, because for me, I was young and excited in terms of building a company. But you know what, other people saw an opportunity that this thing is growing, this thing is big. And obviously they went, they registered the company, they patented their brands and everything. Without you knowing? Without me knowing. Oh, wow. So obviously after doing all these things, you know, one of the days you just meet people and they tell you, you know what, we're giving you an employment contract. You're actually an employee of to this company, company, of the company that well, I that's started. Unfortunate. So it, it was one of those things. But during that time, um, that's when I, I said, you know what, I can't work with people that are, that are not honest. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's where, you know, differences started coming in, um, in terms of, you know, how I felt, you know, they'd done the whole thing, right. trying to, to steal the company, mm -hmm. you know, away are from these me. local people? Yeah. So they were Chinese people. Okay. And, you know, um, I had brought in, you know, other local, local players, players as well. Um, so they kind of like teamed up the Chinese and the local people. Um, then I then ended up having to, to move out and let go of the company uh, because of that. Um, I then started another company called G-Mobile. Okay. Um, I, I was so, you know, in love with the G. The G, the I couldn't, I, signature. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't <laughs> let it go. So we, I built another brand, um, you know, uh, called G-Mobile um, out of anger and bitterness of what obviously had happened to say, you know what, people have stolen the company that I've built. Uh, but in it was doing, basically your baby. It, it was my baby, you know. Um, so after doing that, I then, you know, was forced to, to, to get quick money again. I then got quick money from some loan sharks so that I could quickly, you know, launch, um, you know, G-Mobile. Without was like, knowing what it entails, getting that with, kind of money. Yeah, without knowing what it entails. So I built G-Mobile. I think I know in Zimbabwe, I then introduced credit financing which now everyone is, is doing where people were then now buying phones on credit. Right. I then introduced credit financing on Jumobile, Mobile and it was like a new thing where someone would actually buy a phone on credit. Um, for me, it has always been about access. So doing this was creating access. So we became the, the device of preferred choice in all people that were formerly employed and we grew very big. But right. then inflation came, uh, 2008, 2009. Obviously, we're giving loans for phones to civil servants, 24 months to pay. Inflation came, that whole money was useless, um, you know, after the inflation. $20 but the, now was not worth the same $20 was, was three worth months nothing. later. Yes, and the loan sharks that had given us the, the money, in the loan agreement, they had some clauses there that, you know, actually meant that whatever they'd given us was equivalent to a specific amount in U.S. dollars, irrespective of whatever would have happened. And we then discovered of what's happening in the economy at that time. Irrespective of that. We then discovered the agreement that they actually used, that we signed, was not a Zimbabwean agreement. It was actually a foreign agreement that they actually used. So effectively, it was like we got money from a foreign company 
petroleum Using company, local which, which was actually here in Zimbabwe. Oh, wow. So now it then created other issues. We went to the courts. Right. We felt, you know, we, we kind of won. They appealed. We didn't know how that happened. Yeah. What we only remember is we then remember these guys getting a writ of execution. Um, and when the inflation had happened, we, what I'd done is I then kind of recapitalized the business. I then used the assets, the houses, everything that I had to get a loan from the bank. So I got a loan, recapitalized the business. Now the economy was dollarized. Right. Then brought in a consignment of funds during that time. I know it, the value was almost, the resource value was over a million dollars of those funds that I brought in. US dollars. US dollars. But these guys were keeping that rate of execution. And they were obviously working with people inside. The phones came uh, today. The following day, they and the deputy sheriff, they were there. The so they the took phone. all the phones, they took all the furniture, they took all the cars and everything. And you the lost company everything again. Again. And the company closed. Because everything was taken. How many years after when you had started G Tide? Like this is a period of how long? Um, five years. Okay. It was like two years. After I left, she died. Right. It was two years. So during that time, I then pretty much lost everything. I think I was so devastated. I was so discouraged. And you know, people would just say, yeah, you know what? You know, people would laugh at you. You know, if you're a young, very successful you you know, you had entrepreneur, order. I thought I did everything in order, mm. you know, um, and I lost everything. Mm. So I always tell people that, you know, I moved from a seven bedroom house that I owned, a huge double story in Glenlon. I lost that house and I then started staying in a flat uh, with my cousin and me and my wife and my one kid just at that time we were now sleeping in the in the dining Aww. because this guy had a one bedroom flat mm. so that's how bad things were and um, so it was it was crazy for me and yeah I tried to reach out to a couple of friends that I knew you know suddenly people disappear when things That's like when you that see happen. who your real friends are. Yes, yeah. So, so is this what then prompted the creation of Astro Mobile? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is this is what, after that, kind of gave up, but I told myself that, you know what, I was born to do this, and, you know, I'll not give up. So right. I started again, started writing a business plan again, started going, talking to people, trying to convince them. We're now more informed at this now point. Now I'm more informed, yeah. yes. You know, I can build this, you know, there's still an opportunity to produce affordable devices in Africa. Right. Um, and I believe there's a gap. And I believe that there's a real problem that needs someone to do something about it. So it, it, it took time. You know, people didn't How believe in time? me. Um, almost a year mm -hmm. of, of talking to people. And the breakthrough was, you know, when I went to, um, um, to, to a conference in New York, uh, which is called 95% Market Share which is facilitated by Celebration Church. So pretty much I go to Celebration Church. And, um, you know, my pastor during that time, he said, you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have money. So, but, you know, I, I figured out a way and then I went there. So pretty much you get exposure to how people build these mega businesses that we see today. Right. And uh, you also network with people. So, you know, I shared my story, you know, and people were so touched that, you know what, such a, a black person right. and you're able to do this and build a technology company and you lost that company this way you know people are not people are not are not, are not okay you mm -hmm. know um but i left i didn't get the money that i expected i would get from there but a couple of months later um that i that's that's when i met uh, i'd met nigel Shanakira there mm -hmm. a couple at of months at York. the conference in, in there so i also spoke to him about the story uh, then i came back months later you know, went to him, spoke to him. He was very excited about what I was doing. And he always says, you know what, I always thought that I was the, the youngest, the person that became a millionaire at the youngest age. Yeah. And, you know, you, you started an amazing company at a much, much age, lesser age than mine. Right. So, you know, you, you're supposed to be supported. So, you know, after that, to move the story, you know, uh, forward, you know, you know, he then invested into Astro. So um, him in his personal capacity or him as, as the bank that he was him in, in his personal capacity. Okay. So he then invested. That's when Astro came. Then I said, you know what, um, I'm going to create a business that is going to be a light that is going to shine in the whole of Africa. Right. And I'm going to build something so strong that it's not going to easily be shaken or fallen down. 
and from that time because that's all these experiences and lessons and lessons in the past, yeah. yes in the past that's when the name astro came because astro basically means the the brightest star did you get over the G now? Are you like? No, I, I thought maybe the G had issues, so <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to I had to completely change mm -hmm. into into Astro. So that's how we started Astro. Right. You know, started five employees. At some point, we grew to two thousand employees. Um, you know, we we expanded into the whole of the region: Malawi, right. Zambia, South Africa, yeah. Mauritius, and stuff like that. So that's how we then rebuilt into what is this brand today. That was actually going to be my next question, yeah. that I think for businesses to grow, there is need to diversify. Yeah. And I think now you have other initiatives such as the, the e Shaggy. Can you briefly, briefly tell us about what that's about? So uh, pretty much, you know, during the journey uh, of, 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 of creating, you know, uh, devices that are affordable for people in Africa, we then saw that um, the phone is now pretty much the integrator. Mm -hmm. You know, your banking is on the phone, your financial services are on the phone, your entertainment is on the phone. So pretty much all our lives are centered around the device. So when I realized that, I said, you know, why, why should we just sell the phone? Why can't we also build solutions that sit on the phone that will help people to do much more things than just using the phone as a phone? Right. So because our main business has always been providing financing for people to buy phones, we then created a platform which is, you know, Ishagi, mm -hmm. which pretty much we then said, instead of giving people just phones, why can't we give them money? Why can't we help them to, 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 to buy the furniture that they want? Why can't we help them to build the houses that they want to build? Mm -hmm. Why can't we help them to buy the dream cars that they want to, to, to do that? So it's move. It's not only about the phone now, it's about all these other aspects that people want to talk about. We have to take yeah. a quick break now, yeah. and thereafter we will continue with the conversation and learn a bit more from you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for staying with us. I'm Mona Lisa Dube here on The Champions. And the champion we are celebrating today is Dr. Munyara Ziguatizo, uh, the co founder of Astro Mobile and is the chief executive officer of Astro Technology. Now, we want to know more about uh, I know just before the break, we we're talking about one of the products that you offer, Ishagi. So tell us about the process now, how you do. I know that from the experiences that you've just shared with us, you now do things differently. So how do you actually create this Astro Mobile phone? So, so pretty much in terms of, um, you know, our vision, like what I said, is, is to create access. Um, creating access 
it means creating affordable devices. Mm -hmm. If you look at the statistics right now, you still see that Africa is still less than 50% in terms of smartphone penetration rate. And what has happened with COVID, you actually see the more importance why each and every person should have a smartphone. Right. Um, because e-learning is happening on smartphones, uh, financial services are happening on smartphones, e-commerce is happening on smartphones. So pretty much uh, for us, the process is how do we reduce the cost? How do we eliminate unnecessary costs While that actually... While integrating all of this. Or integrating all of this. So you, you actually find out that there's instances where people are paying $200 for, for $50 functionality. Mm. So, you know, 90% of the, the, the specification that people buy on devices, they don't use them. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to then customize and create devices that speak to the price range that someone is actually buying that device for. So if someone is buying a basic phone that they pretty much want to go on the internet, they want to be on Facebook, they want to be on WhatsApp, there's no need for them to buy a phone with an 8 GB RAM, for example. They can still do with a 1 GB RAM. So pretty much, but that actually helps to reduce the cost of those devices that uh, you know, they have to buy. So in the process, we've actually managed to build what we call a prepaid phone that we'll be launching very soon. Because reducing the cost of devices, we're not reducing them you know, enough for people to actually afford them. Right. We then developed a technology, a lock technology, which enables us to actually finance devices to the informal sector. Because one of the things that everyone has been crying about in all the countries we operate in is you're only giving these facilities to people that are formally employed, while least 70% of the people are informally employed in Africa. So what we then did is to develop this technology, which enables someone to buy and use the phone on a prepaid basis. Mm -hmm. If they don't pay, the phone locks. Oh, that's so in other words, you're actually activating the usage of your phone. So what it means that everyone will be able to have access to your phone. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't pay, you don't use the phone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so when is this launching? You said that it's launching soon and how, pe how can people access the phone? So the people will be able to access the phone through our website. They'll be able to access the phones through our distribution partners that we have, TV Sales and Hire, or Kmart, and many more people, network operators like Econet, NetOne. You'll be able to actually access the product. Um, in the next two months, um, this product will be available. And people will be able to pay as, as low as a dollar to use the phone. So pretty much dollar everyone... Dollar per month? Dollar per week. You can oh. choose to pay per week. You can choose to pay per day. You can choose to pay per month. So it's very flexible and it's connected to your mobile money. Mm. So pretty much it basically deducts whatever amount you, you tell it to do. You know, it's interesting how yeah. you speak about accessibility and trying to make sure that you accommodate everyone. But whenever people hear about something that's relatively cheap like that, they now start questioning the quality and uh, all these questions. How would you respond to that? Um, you know, I was talking to some friends a couple of days ago. And um, probably I'll give you an example of, of, of phones that we all know. I can give you an example of an iPhone, for example. In as much an iPhone is deemed to be very expensive, but it's not expensive to acquire. Because everyone that is sitting in America today, they don't even pay for it. They just go to a network operator and they get it for free for actually using the service. So 90% of the people, they buy it on contracts. Right. And they're paying less than $20 a month. Even if you go on the Apple website, you actually find out you can buy it as low as $20 a month. Mm -hmm. So something being of high quality, it doesn't mean that it has to be expensive. Right. That's why we create these financed options so that you don't need to fork out $250 at once, but you can actually be paying $10 a month, which is what you can afford. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that as Africans, we've got a lot more things to do. Right. with our money is than just to buy phones. Now there's a lot of yeah. information that you're sharing with us yeah. uh, during this conversation about the importance of knowing how much your phone can do for you. Yeah. Do you provide this uh, education, if I may call it, uh, to some of your low-end users to actually understand what the Astro Mobile is about? So it's something that we have recently started because we have realized that people don't understand what they can do with their phones. Um, and the value that they're sitting with with their phones. So you find out many people wanting to buy laptops, for example, mm -hmm. but they don't know that 
80% of the things that you do on your laptop, you can do them on your phone. Right. So it's this kind of education that we are educating our customers uh, to be able to do. And we've recently started setting up, you know, agency networks across the country. And part of those agency networks that we are building is to be able to educate people in terms of how they can derive the best value out of their devices. Mm -hmm. Because for us now, it's not just devices, like what I've said. You buy a phone, it comes pre-installed with an Ishagi application. You can borrow money, mm. you can eventually transfer money. Um, it also comes with the product that is called Pulse that we have, which is one of the, the, the wearables that I have, which is a health and wellness solution that we actually have. We're actually paying people to be healthy. Right. So if you exercise, if you walk, we actually pay you every month for actually staying fit because we care for Africa that much. Uh -huh. Yeah, we want people to be healthy. Okay, so you walked us through your journey. You spoke about uh, how your first company collapsed, the second, and you spoke about how inflation played a part into uh, the collapse of your other business. As you're running Astro Mobile now, what are, what are your fears, especially in the Zimbabwean context, like your concerns that you are really looking out for as you do a business? I think, you know, the biggest concern is obviously the inconsistencies in policies um, where our policies, they frequently change right. and it makes it very difficult for, for me as an entrepreneur to be able to plan. So obviously as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking at what strategies can I come up with so that I protect myself from these kind of volatilities that can happen, especially on the, on the, on the, on the, on the forex side mm -hmm. of things. So for us as a business, we've managed to, to set up other offices in the region and we are looking at... Zambia is one yeah, of them. Yeah, we've got Zambia, we've got Malawi, we've got Mozambique um, and, you know, we're growing our brand into Tanzania, Kenya and Nigeria and, and Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, and we've managed to have strategic partnerships with like big network operators like Vodacom, MTN, Airtel across the entire, you know, African region. So for us, we see Zimbabwe as a as a as a as a home right but we don't see zimbabwe as the entire business i think it's high time as entrepreneurs we start to see you know africa and the globe as a market and once we do that whatever dynamics that happen internally they don't affect your business mm -hmm. because you are in 10 other countries so you can always leverage that, that risk is that how we should be, um, that ideally, that you have backup in other countries so that you, you cushion your business? You know, I, I believe to a certain extent it's a good thing mm -hmm. because for me it helped me to be able to look outside. Right. If there was no issues like the issues that we faced of hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, I would have never thought to open up Astro in other countries. Mm -hmm. But once I started opening Astro in other countries, I actually saw, oh, you know, why focus on Zimbabwe, which has got 16 million people, when I can focus in other markets that have got 200 million people right. like Nigeria? You know, if Facebook has got a solution in America and we're all using it in the globe, what stops Astro from creating products that can be used in the globe? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it kind of helped me to see things differently. And now I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. And Zimbabwe is it's the least of my concerns in terms of what's going to happen in Zimbabwe. So your cha I, the challenges actually resulted in solutions in for solutions. your company. Now for us is how can we help Zimbabwe stabilize mm. by the amount of business that we can generate outside, outside. Zimbabwe. So right. we, we're now trying to be a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. How can we generate more foreign currency into the country by actually exporting technology all over the world? Okay. Here on The Champions, we also want to inspire younger entrepreneurs. That's why we bring people like yourselves to come and share your story so that they can learn a thing or two. So let's talk about the importance of, of mentorship. Do you have a mentors in your life that you look up to that have shaped who you are today? Yes, definitely. You know, every entrepreneur, you need those people because they help you to avoid certain mistakes that they would have probably also, you know, made. And it helps you to, to, to grow faster. So for me, I've got local and international, um, you know, mentors mm -hmm. uh, that I talk to. You know, locally, I've got my pastor, Pastor Tom. I think I, I already mentioned Nainji Chanakira. Mm -hmm. He played a pivotal role in terms of, um, you know, where I am today. So you reckon the spiritual, I know you mentioned Pastor Tom, the spiritual yeah. aspect of mentorship is important. It's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of brings a different dimension of things um, to you as an entrepreneur. Right. Um, you know, there are certain things that you can explain. You know, um, everything can be scientific, but there are certain things that, you know, can only be 
explained spiritually. Right. And, and it's something that is a bigger part of who I am, um, as, you know, as a person that believes in, 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 in the spirituality of things as a Christian. Um, then I also believe that you need to have the practical side of things mm -hmm. where you have people that have walked the road, right. that have faced the challenges, and that can help you to overcome some of those things. And the other person like that is, is Nigel Chanakira. Um, then, you know, obviously you've got people like Strive Masiwa. You know, he's, he's obviously done a lot in terms of crossing out the boundaries, right. um, you know, of just creating a Zimbabwean business into a global business. So it's, it's some of the people that, you know, I, 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 I'm very inspired with and that encouraged me to continue doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got other black people like Fred Swansika. What would you uh, tell an aspiring entrepreneur to look out for? I, I think, you know, young entrepreneurs, they shouldn't, you know, um, underestimate the importance of advisors. Mm -hmm. So pretty much when I was a young entrepreneur, I didn't understand why someone would need a financial advisor or right. why someone would need a legal like advisor. Like a qualified financial advisor. Yes. Yeah. You know, they save you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, they help you to structure your business much better. So it's very important to actually look for people that have done it before. Mm -hmm. So if you're in manufacturing, business, look at someone who's already in manufacturing business, mm -hmm. go and learn from them. If you're in financial services, you go and talk to people that are in the financial services and learn from them. So, you know, outside mentorship, there's issues to do with learning, right. where you need to have advisors, people that can tell you how it's done. I think it's, it's actually very important, you know, for so young it needs entrepreneurs. A lot of research. There is a lot of research um, that needs to be done for young people. And um, the, the other issues is, is young people, you know, they have to be long-term oriented. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges that we have with, with, with young entrepreneurs... You're an instant generation. An, yes, it's an instant <laughs> generation. Someone wants to start a business today. They make money now. They want to make money now, mm -hmm. buy a car now, you know, uh, buy a house, show off to their friends. Right. So it's, it's that mentality that has to change, that a business is built over time. Mm -hmm. From the time that I started GTAD up to now, it's like 13 years. Right. And it means 13 years of doing business, 13 Learning. years of making mistakes mm -hmm. and correcting those mistakes and many, making mistakes again right. and correcting those mistakes again. So And not giving up. And not giving up. So it's, it's very important to understand that business is not a one-day thing. Right. We need to build businesses with you know, 100 years in our minds, with mm -hmm. generational businesses in our minds. As we, as we wrap up, uh, Munyaradzi, um, you spoke about how uh, Nigel Chanakira has support, supported you and believed in your vision. And I know and a lot of issues when it comes to young people has to do with, with capital. So if a young person were to come to you today, uh, they have a business idea, would you, would you support them financially? Would you actually give them money to start the business? If yes or no, what would be the reasons and what would be your criteria? Definitely a yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a lot of young people that approach me and I'm really trying my best to invest in their ventures. Because if Nigel Chanakira hadn't believed in my venture, Astro right. would not be here today. And there is a thousands of young people out there that have got brilliant ideas that no one is funding. Mm. So all the amazing companies that we talk about today, be it your Facebook, be it your Amazon, be it your Microsoft, it was an idea from a young person right. and someone believed in that idea and they were willing to put money into that idea. So as long as we start understanding that the future belongs to the young people mm -hmm. and those are the people that have got the solutions for tomorrow, then we have not yet started. So for me, I have to do my part. Mm -hmm. I, it's something that I encourage every, every company to do, every financial well, what institution your criteria to do. Be, obviously, you're not going to fund everybody who comes to you. What, what sort of criteria would you use? You know, the, the, the criteria sometimes is very difficult mm -hmm. because you need specific skills to be able to assess which is a good investment and which is a bad investment. Right. So what it means is entrepreneurs should then partner with you know, respective venture capital vehicles that are already there. Mm -hmm. So when you're investing in a business, it doesn't mean you invest directly. Right. You can invest through other vehicles for you to actually be able to contribute to this whole ecosystem mm -hmm. because analytics and business you know, analysis cannot be something that all of us can do. Right. But, but for me, you know, it's, it's obviously looking at, you know, businesses that speaks to, to our vision. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that are in line with technology because that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. But if you come with a brick-making business, I would not probably be able to understand and Absolutely. contribute to that. Mm -hmm. but, but I still feel that I can still contribute to someone in agriculture, right. but I partner people that has got enough resources to be able to understand much better, you know, in terms of these diversified businesses. All right, so earlier on you spoke about the importance of marketing, the importance of advertising. So um, we're giving you a free minute to advertise Astro Mobile. So how would you advertise your products in a minute? Um, so we are a pan-African technology company, as Astro Technology Group, and we've got interest in four key sectors. Uh, financial services, where pretty much we're creating access to millions of uh, unincluded people to be able to have easy access to credit. We also have got um, a solution called Pulse, which is a health and wellness solution where we are creating and building a healthy Africa. We also have got a software development company called Algebra, where we are basically helping small companies to develop software mm -hmm. that is helpful to actually help them to increase their efficiencies in what they do. Right. So pretty much you'd find out as a company, those are the main things that we do, but everything revolves around Astro Mobile because we believe everything is driven from a mobile device. If you don't have a mobile device, you can't do anything. And for us, we are building devices that are made for Africa, for Africa, and affordable so that each and every person in Africa is able to have an affordable, fully supported, functioning mobile device. So people can get us uh, on our website, www.astroafrica.tech, and from there you're able to see the different aspects and facets of our business and the different subsidiaries that we have as a company. I bet you after this you're going to be getting a lot of phone calls and DMs, but thank yeah. you so much for your time, uh, Dr. Miyazi Gwatizo. We appreciate your time with us here on The Champions and sharing your life story. Thank you very much for having me. It has been a pleasant conversation.